pleasure to be here tonight. Um, just so I can get an idea of uh, our audience here, uh, how many people are actual board members right now? Oh, okay, great. Um, and of the people that are board members, how many are treasurers? Okay, that's even better. Okay, so, um, so that's why I'm assuming you're here, is to get a little better background about accounting. Okay, since not everyone is a treasurer, and there's so many times even with the treasurers that we deal with get put into that position when they really don't have an accounting background. <coughs> so the first thing I want to make sure everyone understands, since this is Accounting 101, some people think, okay, it's the budget, oh, I just have to look at the financials. Other people think, well, it's just a tax return. Although I have to tell you, I had 10 new clients this year, associations that didn't know they had to file tax returns. What? So they have them all the time still. It's just amazing. They said we're not for profit. That means we don't have to pay anything, so we don't have to file. Well, uh, they were wrong. <laughs> so uh, there's basically three phases that we're kind of going to go through here tonight. There's the planning phase, the operation phase, and the valuation phase. So what I usually tell a lot of the boards is to me one of the most important things that any association needs to have to be successful. So you have to have a plan. That's the real key. So the planning phase to me is the most important because everything takes off from here. So your plan for your current year is your budget and your plan for the future is your reserve study. And if without a plan you have no idea what your association needs to do for you. You don't know what assessments to collect, what to pay. Same thing on the, the reserves. So and we're going to get into both of these a little more detail. The operation phase is the phase that you're dealing with monthly. So that's paying your bills, you know, <coughs> filling out the assessments, collecting your assessment, doing the, the bank reconciliations, doing the financial statements, uh, collecting uh, your assessments, and of course, investing those reserve funds. So we're going to kind of go and touch base on, on all three of these areas too. In the last phase, which a lot of people still don't understand is that getting a, an outside accountant to come in and either do a compilation or a review and audit. Um, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why that is important. And then the last thing we're going to talk about, uh, if we have time, is to talk a little bit about the taxes. Okay, so this is a question I ask all the time. And since this is Accounting 101, I think everyone should know the answer to this. Okay, who's responsible for the financial information of the organization? Uh, how many people think it's the management company? Oh my gosh, see, that's why you're here. Okay, that is good, because uh, that's what I want to make sure you know. But the most important thing I want to make sure you know, and that's why I asked the question originally, how many people are uh, the treasurers, is because the board has to have involvement in an association. For any association to be successful, you have to have total board involvement. Every time we see that there's only one person involved with the financial information of the association, we find problems. And I, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens so many times over my 35 plus years in this industry. I've seen it so many times. And the, the real key here is that the board is responsible for the financial information. It's not just the treasurer. And when you just have one person that knows what's going on, it's what's called the fraud triangle. Uh, motivation, opportunity, and rationalization. We see this all the time, that if one person knows nobody else is looking over the records of your association, you know, the first thing is they have some type of motivation. It could be they have lots of bills, uh, they could be, have a gambling problem. We've seen the gambling problem lots of times. Um, and if they have the opportunity, which means they know nobody's looking over anything, so they figure, okay, and then they're going to rationalize and say, well, I'm doing all this work for this association. I deserve this money on top of it. So that's really what happens. And, uh, I mean, here, I just took this out of the uh, paper uh, today. Former condo board president, vice president guilty of grand theft. So what they were doing, they were stealing money, taking it out of the association, and before they had their monthly meetings or their, uh, with the board and their monthly financials, they borrowed money from different people to put it back in so nobody knows that they stole the money. 
So they were just shifting it from pool to pool until they couldn't borrow the money from anybody anymore, and then the associations were all working without their money. Uh, so this is just one, it happens all, all the time. I mean, right now we're doing an association where again, there's just one person involved, and we started looking through the bills, and we see all these food bills. And so the president who's taking care of the association says, well, I'm here all day long, I'm self-managed, I'm taking care of the bills, so I'm buying food. And I'm buying food for the janitor, and I said, well, does the board know, does anybody know this? That this is one of she says no. So I said, well, and we wouldn't, if we weren't doing a certified audit, we wouldn't have found it. So uh, when we disclosed it to the board, then they all got together to discuss how they were going to go forward with this. But it's a key issue. Yes? You did say that the board is responsible, which that I understand, but what if the management company is actually managing the funds? Well, but that's the, the key thing. So if it's your reserve money, you should be in control of your reserve money. Okay. So, the, and you should have two signatures on your reserve money by two different board members to make sure that one board member isn't stealing those funds. For a management company, usually they're going to have the ability to pay certain monthly bills or um, bills under a certain dollar amount. Anything else should be approved by the board. Well, it's approved by, by the treasurer me. Right. But they put in the invoice, they do a, per, a first approval, I do a final approval, and then they pay it. And when right. reserve their operating income, it doesn't matter. Right. So then how you make sure everything's done, you have to review your monthly financials. Okay. That, and we're going to get into that. That monthly financial packet is so important that you have to review it to make sure you understand what's going on. So that's how you would do it. Excuse uh, me, would you say that again about the management association has the ability to do money's under a certain... Well, yeah, you could you could do a certain dollar amount. Like you could say, hey, anything under this dollar amount, please pay anything over this. That's not recurring bills. Okay, so that would that would be up to you. I am not sure how ACM. Tom, do you know how ACM does it? Um, I sorry, I was reading. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, bills over a certain dollar amount. You have a certain dollar amount, and anything under no. that. Carl, 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 <laughs> Carl would use them. Before they're, before they're sent out. Okay. Okay, so it, it all depends upon the association, what you want to do. I mean, that's a real key thing. So, okay, so um, as we talked about, the financial statement is what really safeguards your assets because you, you have to know what's going on. I mean, it's a real key thing. So, in order to uh, truly understand your financial statements, you have to understand what basis of accounting you're on. Okay, what types of funds you, you have, uh, besides just your operating fund and your reserve fund. And this, this is probably one of the most important things, comparing your actual to the, your budget. You know, when I said before about your budget, once you have that budget, the next key thing is every single month, you should be looking at your actual financial statements and comparing to those budgeted figures. And when there are differences, those are the things you want to look into. So if you have that monthly financial package, you have the disbursements, okay? You should be looking at that. You should see why did it go. You have the general ledger. So you can see what got posted to each of these different accounts. So this is one of the key things, and you use this by looking at this. This helps you prepare your budget for the next year, but you can see, well, what did we do wrong? Uh, you know, what weren't we looking at? Now that we can see what's actually happening, now we know what to do. So that's a key thing. And of course, the last thing is just understanding your property. So there's three different bases of accounting, which is the cash basis, the modified cash, and the accrual basis. Does everyone kind of understand the three different bases, or are there people here that don't understand? Okay. So we'll go into it a, a little bit here. So the first one is the cash basis. That's the one that's real easy to understand. You receive your money in, you pay your bills out, you got your ending bank balance. Okay, so all you're going to see, and we'll go through an example, is here's what got received, here got what paid out, and that's your bottom line net income. Real easy. Okay, and, and on that, it could be what your management company is doing. Oh, management companies all do different bases, so um, that could be the, the real reason, but it's really easy to understand. The method that's preferable is an accrual basis method. So this method is basically 
shows what your true financial position is. And why does it show your true financial position? Because it's showing you what you build up, okay, during the month. You know, so it shows what income was billed, okay, and it shows what expenses were actually incurred during the month. So now you're just not saying, here's what got received and here's what got paid. Now you're actually looking at it and saying, okay, if this really got billed during the month, now I know what my true assessment should be, and that should agree with my budget, okay? And now I know what expenses truly got incurred, not just what I paid. Because, you know, you're not looking at a true picture if it's not everything that got incurred for the month. So because of that, you're going to have receivables and payables. Because not everyone pays all their, uh, uh, their assessments every month, and not every association pays 100% of their bill. So it's real important. We're going to go over some examples on that. And if you do have a certified audit, that's the method that's going to be uh, used, is um, the accrual basis. Okay, so let's go over, there's, there's two parts of a financial statement. There's a balance sheet and an income statement. So the balance sheet has your assets, that's what you own. It's got your liabilities, is what you owe. And then it's got your fund balance or your member's equity. And that's the true amount of what you actually own. And, and the reason they call it a balance sheet is there's all these balancing equations. So when you take a look at, you've got your assets, which, which is what you own. You, you subtract out any liabilities that you have, and you come out with your true equity. This is what your true net worth, what the association truly owns, is that fund balance. So it's your assets less your liabilities equals what you truly own. And we're going to uh, go over some examples on that. Okay? So here's a, a balance sheet. And on your packet, I think there was a couple mistakes. You didn't have the accounts receivable in there, which you should. And this should be pound two. Okay? So when you're looking at your balance sheet, you, you have your cash and you've got your investment. When you're looking at that on a monthly basis, look at that bank reconciliation. Does that bank reconciliation equal that cash? A real key thing as a board member when you're starting to look at your financial. Look at your investments, okay? You should have, if there's a reserve money market account, it, hopefully a part of your financial packet, somebody else besides the treasurer should have a money market statement that, that should have, you know, like I said, two signatures. So somebody else on the board should have another copy of the reserve money market account if you have CDs. You want to make sure you know the C, what CDs you have, when the due dates for maturity are, so you're keeping track of that so they don't get lost. Your receivables, a real key item, like I said before, this is what tells you what people still haven't paid. If you have a collection policy, you should be following that collection policy. It's extremely important. And if, if you have a collection policy, you're using an attorney to do collection work, you, you should make sure that those items are going to the attorneys, and then you should discuss with the attorneys where are we at with any accounts that got turned over uh, to your attorneys for collection. Prepaid expenses. Does everyone here know what a prepaid expense is? Okay, so most of you don't. So what that means is you might have paid a bill, let's say it's the end of the year, it's December, okay? And you pay for the utility bill, um, well I shouldn't use it, let's say your insurance. So your insurance comes and you get 2017's insurance bill in 16, and you pay it in December 16. Well, you prepaid that bill. So on the accrual basis, you would be showing that as a prepayment. Okay, you wouldn't take that as an expense in 16, you would take it in 17. If you're doing a cash basis, you would actually be showing that as a 16 bill. So now when you're looking at your budget, compared to your financial, you're going to say, oh my gosh, my insurance looks too high here. And that's because on a cash basis, you would be overstating your insurance. That's one of the reasons why uh, the accrual basis is better, and if your management company is doing a cash basis, these are the things you've got to look at if you're not going to get a CPA firm to give you a year-end financial statement. Uh, the due to from funds, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, fixed assets. What we get asked all the time is, Steve, why isn't everything being capitalized on our balance sheet? You know, we're doing these major improvements to our common elements. Why aren't they being capitalized? The real key is the association doesn't own the common elements. So, 
because those are all your reserve expenses whenever you're doing major improvements to the association. Those all get expensed, and you'll see them right on your, your income statement. The only thing you really capitalize is what you have title to, which would be any equipment or furniture, uh, pool furniture, etc. that would get capitalized. Usually there's a capitalization policy that anything over a certain dollar amount you would capitalize and depreciate over their estimated use of life. The other way is if you have a for-profit motive. So let's say your association was going to build a garage. And from that garage, part of that you've decided, we want to make some money and, and be able to pay back the cost of this garage. So we're going to take part of that garage and we're going to lease it out to people in the neighborhood. Well, the portion of that garage that you're going to lease out to people in the neighborhood, that would get capitalized and put onto your balance sheet. Because that's not why you have your association. Um, that would be something different and that's why it would get capitalized. The other parts there are your liabilities. Again, liabilities are only shown when you have an accrual basis financial statement. So you have your payables. Somebody prepays their assessments. It's not income in 2016 if they're prepaying them for 17. You would show them on your uh, uh, income statement on the liability, I mean on the balance sheet in your liability section. If you're doing a cash basis, it would show in there, again, when you go to, to look at your budget compared to your uh, actual financial statement, on a cash basis, it would never balance out, very rarely. But on an accrual basis, whatever you have in your budget for assessment, that's what your actual number should come out to be at the end of the year. And then you, there's loans on here, and of course, your equity and your uh, fund balance. And again, your assets, unless your liability equal your equity. Okay? So then you've got your income statement. And again, this shows you what your activity is for a specific period of time. So if you're getting monthly, it shows what your monthly uh, financial activity is. If it's for the year, it shows for the 12 months. So you've got your revenues, your expenses, and then of course your profit or loss on there. And we've already talked about how important that budget variance is. So here's a couple examples just so you can see. Here's just a regular cash basis balance sheet. All you have is cash, okay? And this is just a one fund financial statement. And when you don't have funds, the equity section is called member's equity. When you have funds, it's called fund balances. So that's what the difference is there. <laughs> so and then here's your income statement. Here's the revenues that you collected, the expenses you paid out coming out to your ending balance. And as you see, the 114.293 is the same amount as your cash. So it's just like having a checkbook. Okay, so when you get to an accrual basis one, here's where you can start saying, besides cash, hey, I didn't collect all my receivable. Hey, I, I paid for some insurance that's for the next year. We didn't get to pay all of our bills, so we have some accounts payable. Okay, so your equity now is, has changed. You don't have the same amount. So same thing when you're looking at your revenue and expenses, because now your, your revenue is 87000 which it wasn't before. Um, it was only 85, 89, because that's all you collected. Remember, your, your budget said 87, so that's what that number was. Okay? And here on the cash basis, your profit is 9,000, <coughs> when on a pro basis, it's actually 98.74. So this shows your actually true financial position, shows your true um, net revenue, uh, you know, and that's what you have is excess revenue over expense. Okay, now for types of funds. There's actually four types of funds. Most of you probably heard of the operating and the reserve. <coughs> well, there's actually two other funds that uh, we're going to talk about uh, besides that. So your operating fund, I think everyone knows what the operating fund is to pay your, your monthly uh, expenses for your operations. The, the real key here is, again, is on this reserve fund. Um, I get asked so many times, people come up to me and they say, Steve, what should I have in my reserve fund? You know, they said, just tell me. And I said, well, I don't know anything about your association. I don't know what projects you have coming up. I don't know what projects you're doing. I don't know what projects you're financing. So the real key, again, is to do some type of a reserve study. It's extremely important because if you're charging individuals to put money into your reserve account, if you truly don't know what you're putting that money for, and we find this so many times, you have no idea. Um, uh, we just got a new association. They said, oh yeah, we did a reserve study. I said, okay, can I, said, I see it? 
and it's like chewed up from a dog. And I start taking a look at it, it's 15 years old. And I said, oh, now I understand why the dog chewed it up. It's worthless. Right. So um, I, I, you really have to, with these research studies, they should be updated every three to five years. But we, what we always tell boards is you should be reviewing these every single year. You should not wait three to five years because so many things change each year. So you have to kind of look at it and say, okay, here's what the study said, but we didn't do this project right now. Well, you know what? We're going to do some additional maintenance. We're going to push it off. Well, then you've got to kind of revise your funding schedule so that, so that it does change. So that's why we always tell boards, look at this. It's especially important when you're doing your budget. You should look at it not only for this next coming year, but we always recommend people look out three years. Look out in the future. You've got to see what's coming up because you've got to say, will I have the funds to pay this or I won't have the funds? And we're going to talk about that in a, in a second. So here's why uh, you should have a reserve study besides what I just mentioned. First of all, the, the uh, Condominiums Act talks about having reasonable reserves. They talk about how to be able to measure if you have reasonable reserves. And they really give a definition of having some type of a reserve study. Take a look at your bylaws and declaration. It is so important. I can't tell you, and we're going to go over quite a few different things here. How many boards never look at their bylaws and declaration? I bet you David could tell you that too. That there are so many associations that never look at their bylaws and declaration. Um, I can say that that is true. <laughs> so it's, it's, it, there are so many things in there that you really have to look at. And this could be one of them. Okay, And we're going to go over some of the others. Uh, again, it's part of your due diligence as board members. It's not the treasurer's responsibility, it's the board's responsibility to make sure you have a plan to fund those capital expenditures. Future bias, I can't tell you how important this is. So many times we have board, I have clients coming up to me and they say, Steve, should I buy into this association? So the first thing I say is, well, let me see a financial statement, let me see the reserve study. I mean, to me, that's one of the, the key things. And, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't as knowledgeable, but I think more and more buyers are starting to become more aware of it. So I think that's another key thing. It, it really makes your association worth more when they can see that, hey, you have a plan. You are funding for these projects. We're not going to get hit with a special assessment. Um, and of course, if you're going to go out for a loan, banks want to see that you have some type of plan because they don't want to loan you money in this year and then find out next year you're going to come back to them and say, hey, I've got another project coming up. So it's real key. And uh, the same thing if, if you have to file this Form 1120, if you don't have a reserve study and we had to file this, um, uh, this Form 1120, that all your reserve income would be taxable if you didn't have some type of a study or, or plan in place. The IRS would say it would be all taxable. Okay, so one, two key things that I just want to mention here is that I don't think a lot of people understand. Your reserve contributions that you're paying into your association, that really should could be used as basis. Uh, so what that means is, let's say you're going to sell your unit. You know you paid X amount of dollars originally for your unit, okay? So let's say you're selling it for a million dollars and you bought it for 200000 So you have this 800000 gain, I know. It's funny, it doesn't win. Right? <laughs> I'm using it for an example. <laughs> so you know, let's say it's 800000 Well, what you should be doing is keeping track of all the reserve assessments that you've paid in over the years because the reserve assessments can be used as basis to help reduce that gain. So yes, absolutely. So, but you, whoever you're using for your, your tax advisor, I'm not going to give out tax advice because some people might have different opinions. Um, so talk with your tax advisor and see if they agree with that. And if they understand associations, they probably will. But this is a real key thing to keep track of it. Sometimes some of our associations will ask them to give us them a listing every single year. So every year they get a, a listing of all their contributions so it's, it's kept up. But yeah, if you haven't done it, try to go back and start putting that together because it will help you um, as soon as you start turning that large game. Um, the other key thing is investment policy. I can't tell you how important it is to have an investment policy. Um, 
you, 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 get from, you go from board to board, treasure to treasure. Nobody knows why the previous boards did what they did. Well, an investment policy kind of tells you what it, you should be doing with your money. I mean, um, I have like a sample one up here, and it really goes through. What's, what's the goals of the association? Why are you putting money away? That should be stated. And your investment priorities, why are you investing how you are? Are you worried about safety? Okay. Are you worried about liquidity? So does that mean you need to have uh, CDs coming due every you know, two or three years because you have projects coming up? If a new board comes in, they have no idea why you only took out a two-year CD, or maybe they don't know why you took out a five-year CD. So if it's in an investment, they now know why you took it out for that period of time and what projects you have coming up. Or it could be that yield is the most important thing to you and you're going to do whatever you can to get that highest yield out there. So this is what's so important. It's so important to have a policy like this. I recommend it highly for every single association. Um, and um, I've got a, I, I don't have it with my, uh, uh, with my handouts, but if you want to email me, um, I'll be more than happy to send you a copy of an investment policy. Uh, we already talked about the reserve expenses. Capital Improvement Fund. So this is a fund that most of you probably don't use, but if you ever wanted to build something in your association, whether it's a clubhouse, a garage, a pool, anything, or acquire more land, you wouldn't use your reserve money for that. You would set up a separate capital improvement fund and start funding through that. The next one is this operating contingency fund, which I think is so extremely important. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit more about this a little later about how to fund this operating contingency fund. But the real key thing here, when you get most of the reserve studies, they show that like painting, and caulking, all of that's really a reserve expenditure. The IRS doesn't see it that way. The IRS sees it as a uh, periodic maintenance expense. And so technically, if you're putting money away for a big painting project, you should set it aside in a separate operating contingency fund. It shouldn't really be out of your reserve fund. So, uh, so if you are doing that way, we still have associations that do it. They don't listen to me. Um, but it really should be done that way. Um, if you ever get audited, this is what the IRS will look at. Um, uh, you could also be using this operating contingency fund for uh, years when you have bad winter. So you budgeted X amount for snow plowing. You know, your snow plowing was terrible this year. You had snow almost every day. That's what an operating contingency fund would help you for something like that or a real cold winter, so you didn't budget for a real cold winter, your utilities came up much higher, if you had an operating contingency fund, that would help you out. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit later about how to, to uh, fund this. So, because it's really a key thing, besides your major painting and, and caulking and power washing. Because that should be, if your study shows you should, you're having a painting, you know, if you have periodic painting every five years, you should be putting money every single year into that fund in order to have those funds available for that painting project. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you quickly uh, a financial statement that's a fund financial statement. So here you can see now, you can see where's my real cash. So the cash isn't all in operating. You have some cash in operating, some in reserve. Uh, same thing you can see, this is just cash basis. So again, you just have your cash, real easy. Your, on your income statement, again, it shows you the same thing. Here's my expenses. The only thing that went to the reserve fund in this example is just your reserve expenditures uh, got transferred over during the year. What, not your reserve expenditure, what your contributions to reserves were for the year. And here, they actually broke it up. They didn't have a lot of items, and they say, we know what projects are coming up, what we need to put into our reserves, so we're going to break it down and say how much we're going to contribute to each one of these major projects coming up. Not in a separate bank account, it can all be in the same bank account. You just keep track of it separately so you make sure you have those funds available. Uh, here's an accrual basis one. Again, now here you can see you've got accounts receivable. You can see here you've got an inner fund balance where the operating fund owes the reserve fund or the replacement fund $10,000 for some particular reason. You have payables here, 
Um, so then you come down to what your fund balance is here. So here your fund balances are 62,000. Here they were 66 on a cash basis. So here you were actually showing better than what you truly had. You really only had a net worth of 62,000 on an accrual basis because you can see your payables were higher than your receivables. So that's the real key reason. Um, and then here's your uh, uh, income statement. Now, there actually is something wrong on this income statement. I don't know if anybody can see um, offhand, uh, but it, I did this on purpose just to see, to show you that if you're not truly analyzing and looking at your financials every single month, are you going to really know if anything's wrong? So can anybody see anything that looks wrong on this income statement? No? Okay, so here's what's wrong. So let's go back to the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, you see you have the savings account. So you have a checking account and a savings account. So where is this interest income? It's sitting in the operating fund where you only have a checking account and there's no interest in the savings account. Okay? So that should be one of the things that says, okay, what's going on here? How did this balance? Well, maybe that's the reason that the operating fund owes the reserve fund some money because this interest income wasn't recorded properly in the right column. So these are things you want to look at when you're going through it is not only look at your income and expenses, but look at are they in the right funds. So it's a real key thing to make sure that just wasn't an adjustment to make sure that this whole thing balanced. And apparently it's not really 10,000 that's really old between the two funds. So make sure you look at things like this all the time. It's such a key thing. And this is something that again, if, if you're not really concentrating each item separately as you go through and review your income statement, you're not going to find this. Okay, so let's talk about this do to do from. Um, this was one of the things that came out of the, the POM2 case is uh, where they weren't transferring money over. Um, well, it didn't help if the president didn't even understand their own books and records. That was kind of a, a big problem on the case, too. But the bottom line was is they were transferring money. It came to the end of the year, and this happens to us all the time, too. The accountants come in, and we figure out, okay, is, you know, this is a reserve expense, but it got paid to your operating fund. Oh, and you didn't transfer over all your assessments during the year, and then, you know, all of a sudden, we'll come in and we'll have to make sure we straighten it all out and determine, hey, you know, what really happened here? You co-mingled all your funds during the year. So what we always recommend is, number one is, of course, make your monthly transfers of your reserve uh, contributions every single month, but also make sure you make your uh, 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 expense uh, uh, transfers also. So if the operating fund is paying for a reserve project, let's say it's a window project, they paid it out of that operating checking account, make sure you transfer those funds from the reserve account to the operating account. You don't know how many times we either see a round dollar amount, we see some of the money, or we don't see any of the money. So should it always be the exact? Always should be the exact same amount. Because if you don't, that's where you end up having problems. You get to the end of the year, and then you end up with this do to do from, you know, and, and that's where then you get to this issue, are you truly commingling or not? So you want to do this every single month. If you don't need a separate reserve checking account, you just have to make sure that you do transfer those funds. Uh, so how do you fund reserve projects? I put down uh, quite a few ways, and most, most of you probably know it's either from your regular, your reserve assessments, you have to do a special assessment, or a lump sum uh, payment from the homeowners who might have to go out and take a home equity loan to be able to pay that in, or you get a loan from a financial institution, or it could be a combination of all of these things. So the real key is, the reason I bring this up is, again, if you're going to do uh, have uh, to pay for a project, you're going to have to get a loan, or you're going to have to special assess unit owners, and it's going to be uh, payments over a period of years, what we recommend is set up a separate fund for this. So you don't know how many times if, if some of the unit owners are paying back on that loan, okay, for a loan that you use to pay for these expenditures, if it's not set up in a separate fund, that money gets all commingled. So you're not using the money that the people are paying back to pay back the loan, you're using it for other operating expenses. 
So the real key is set up a totally separate fund and a separate bank account. This is where I would set up a separate bank account so that the money is going into that bank account. You're, you can track the, the loan money that's coming out of the bank and uh, you can track the, the assessments that are being paid back in by those unit owners over the life of the, the loan. It's such a, a, a really key thing. So here's an example of one where you do have a special assessment fund. Okay, and it shows you, you want to keep track of all the cash, what's going on, in a separate fund. Uh, so it's such a key thing. The next thing I want to talk about is this excess operating fund. Uh, God bless you. Uh, so this is such a, a key thing that I think a lot of us over the last couple of years, if you have been board members, um, this came out of the POM2 Act too. The, again, the uh, board did look at their <coughs> bylaws and declaration, and their bylaws and declaration clearly said if you have excess operating money, that should be refunded. Okay? Since that time, you have no idea how many associations, if you look at your documents, it definitely might say something like that. I mean, it's, it's jumbled. I think we're seeing probably 30% of the associations we do all have this in there. That any excess operating fund. So if that's not something you want to have happen, then you would have to call, talk to your attorney, someone like David, to, to maybe uh, help you amend that and, and change what your uh, bylaws and declaration say. Um, it's a real, real key thing. So when I told you before, God bless you. So what I told you before, if it says it's to refund it, then you just can't sit there and say, okay, I'm transferring all this excess to reserve, which is what most associations want to do. So th this is a real key problem. It's a key problem for us, too, for income taxes. If we have to file this 1120 form for some reason, most people file 1120H, you know, if you don't have any other income besides interest income. But should you have, um, like some people get income from these cable companies, the antenna income, the renting, mm -hmm. And so that, when you have that, most likely you might have to file a Form 1120 because it has a lower tax rate. So that's one that this, this could hurt you. But if you don't have something like this, remember I told you about that operating contingency fund. So what you can do if you have excess operating income, you can transfer some of that to an operating contingency fund. Because let's say you, you, uh, you have contingencies in your budget for bad possible bad debt or for the snow plumbing or the utility. And your, and your income and your, exp your expenses actually came out lower than what you're originally budgeting for, well now you can take that excess and instead of transferring it over to reserves, you can transfer it to an operating contingency. When would you recommend making that transfer? Um, I would, the year? Yeah, probably at the end of the year when you can actually see, here's what actually happened, you know, um, here's what my actual expenses were, um, here's what my excess total operating uh, fund balance was at the end of the year, so then you could transfer it over to the contingency fund at that time. Is that actual profit and loss or profit? <coughs> yeah, so it would be like, do I have an example? So yeah, so on here, let's say you would have 43087 So you could transfer, if your balance and declaration say you don't refund it, you could transfer all 43000 right over to an operating contingency fund if you wanted to, or just look at your items that you did have contingencies for and just transfer those over and maybe transfer the balance over to reserve. So it gives you some options so that if you have one of these terrible years, you're not sitting there like we see so many times taking money from your reserves. And then you've got different issues when you start doing that. Yes? So if we have a... Uh, category, just uh, landscape extras, snow extras, would that be considered an operating contingency fund? Yes, because you're, you're actually saying you're putting more money away for these extras. Right. Let's say you don't need them. Yeah, then you've, you've got that excess money, the difference between actual and budget. You could transfer that over to this operating contingency fund. Then when you have some extraordinary items happen, you, again, you don't have to go to the bank. You don't have to borrow from your reserves. You have it. So okay. I, it's a real key thing. Okay, I think I've talked about this over and over again, how it's very important to get the actual debut. So let's just take a look at one here. So 
I'm looking here, you can see this is on a cruel basis, so your assessments agree with what you budgeted. Okay, your interest income. Now, if you look at that, you budgeted for over $3,000, but you only had about $1,100. So why did that happen? Well, did you have to, uh, did you use more of your reserve funds than you thought? Were there extraordinary things that happened? Where you, you had some uh, larger reserve projects and they thought that the reserve projects cost you more. Is that the reason that this happened? Um, uh, so th this is why you would want to look at, or th was it the board that said, you know what, in order to balance our budget, we need to have something a little higher amount. Was that the reason? So these are some of the things you want to look at. Same thing with the building maintenance. Well, here you can see that the building maintenance was $8,500 more. Why was that? On a monthly basis, you should be looking at that and looking every single month and seeing why are these things happening. It's, it's, this, is, this, this is really a real key when you're looking at your operations and seeing what is going on here. You have to see why are things different than what you budget. It's so key. Same thing with the insurance. Well, here, your insurance was $28,000 compared to $23,000. Why was it $4,200 more? Did you get an increase? Okay. Did somebody make a mistake and instead of doing it on the cruel basis with the insurance that they just showed as an expense, could that have been it? You know? Uh, or did somebody just weigh off on what they thought the insurance was? And now you know when you go to do your budget for the next year, you have to make these changes. So I can't tell you this. this Budget to variance, looking at that every single month is just so important. Okay, so now we get into this, do you need a financial statement by a CPA firm? So many people say, ah, oh, we don't need it, it's too expensive, I'm already getting a financial statement uh, from our uh, management company, or my treasurer is doing it if you're self-managed. The real key is it's always great, number one, to have a third party eyes look at something. Um, it could be required by your declaration of bylaws. We do see some of the uh, uh, declaration bylaws that do state that you need an audit. Uh, could be required by your lending institution. We've gotten hired so many times by association, and they said we just want a compilation done, and then we look at the loan documents that says they need an audit. And they go, well, we didn't know about that. Again, you have to really read through your documents to make sure you know what they are requiring. And of course, it's part of your, your due diligence here because uh, getting that third party in there, making sure things are good, uh, okay? If you're not gonna have an audit done every year, then have it done every two or every three years at least, and have somebody come in at least annually with a compilation or review. Um, and and it's, it's, it's even more key on self-managed associations, and I can't tell you. Um, the self-managed associations that we do, if we were coming in every year, Boy, um, I can't believe some of the records that uh, we see out of that. Um, and it could be that the management company's financials aren't in the right format. So some management companies are on a cash basis, some are on a modified cash, which I really didn't touch before, but that's basically where they might be showing uh, your income based upon what's billed or earned, okay, but your expenses by, on what's paid. So you still don't know what your true financial position is unless we come in and do an actual cruel basis financial. And I've showed you how, how that does differ, and I just showed you small differences. They could be tremendously different. So uh, that's a real key thing. So here you have um, your year-end uh, financial statement. The compilation is the lowest level. There's no opinion on that. Um, as you get into the review and audit, there's a lot more. And we actually have, and again, this is something if you want to email me, we have a whole sheet that kind of goes over what we do on a compilation and review and an audit. So it gets much more detailed as you go along because the audit is where you're looking at internal controls, you're sending out confirmation, etc. So uh, again, uh, feel free to email me and I'll be more than happy to uh, send that over to you. Uh, the last slide here um, is again going over this monthly financial pack. Um, I can't tell you how important this is that, again, every single month you should be looking at. We already said the balance sheet and income statement. We went over that quite a few times about how important that is. We talked about the aging receivables, how you should be watching that, making sure you're following your, your collection policy. 
uh, going over things with your collection attorney. Your bank reconciliation, you should make sure, especially if you're self-managed, you should make sure that there's a bank reconciliation done every single month on that account. And I already told you, you want to make sure that that bank reconciliation cash agrees with your, your, your books, your, uh, your balance sheet. Um, that's so key. And you want to, on the bank reconciliation, you also want to look at is there deposits in transit? How long has that deposit been in transit? What happened to that deposit? You want to take a look at that. Outstanding checks, if you've had outstanding checks for, for 30 days, you want to start looking at why did it happen? Did that check really get released? Did it not get released? What happened to it? Did it get lost? Is somebody hitting you with interest because they didn't receive your payment? So the bank reconciliation is really a key thing. And also looking at that statement, because we've seen over the years many times where statements have been altered. So where if one person is in charge, we've seen where they alter the actual statement. So hey, if you're going to get reserve statements, get, have two people be able to go online and go right on the, the bank's website, you can look at it right there. Uh, that's, that's such a key thing. Uh, the check register and cash receipts. The check register I talked about before. So important to go look at it. Look at the vendor's names. Make sure these are vendors that you know of, that they're not a vendor that you, you didn't know about, okay? Look at uh, uh, that, that's so important. The same thing with your cash receipts. You're going to look at who's, who's paying in their assessment. The general ledger, to me, is one of my key things all the time because it tells you now the detail of that income statement and balance sheet. So it tells you every single month what the, who the checks were written out to, and now they're recorded under a certain category. So if it's under repairs and maintenance, okay, and you see a vendor for that, you know, you want to make sure, is, is that a repair and maintenance vendor? Maybe you want to look at that invoice if you don't know what that was for. So this kind of told you what's under each one. And remember before I also told you that if something's a little larger than you thought when you're analyzing that income statement, the general ledger is what you go back to. So you say, okay, if my repairs were that high or my insurance was that high, let me take a look, let me go back to the general ledger and let, let me actually analyze it and see why. It's such a key thing. And of course, we talked about the replacement fund and the accounts payable. So uh, if your uh, association does uh, do any type of payables, you want to look at the report. Otherwise, you, you should kind of see yourselves. It, as a board, any of the big projects, keep track of these big projects that if they're being paid out over a period of month, make sure you go back and, and keep track of what's been paid. You don't know how many times we've seen change orders, and we come in at the end of the year, and we've seen some projects where they've had six different change orders. The, the, uh, the management company and the board are both confused about what was paid, who approved the change orders, etc. You have to really keep track of, the, of these very large projects. Again, it really comes back to the board to make sure that you're doing that. Um, so um, that kind of takes care of my presentation. I didn't go into as much on the taxes. Um, I, I went to it in a little bit, but um, I hope this kind of helps you get a little better understanding of what you truly need to do on a month-to-month -month basis and, of course, on an annual basis for your association. Yes? I just had a quick question on the sure. audit. So we were just having a discussion um, because we paid off our loan and they recommend, well, we should have an audit, especially because that's paid off. And he was saying that we should probably have one like at least every other year. Is that a normal practice? Yeah. You have, to have them consistently every year, but maybe every other year? Right, because what happens is I would tell you, yeah, you should do it every year. <laughs> then people would tell me I'm an idiot. Uh, so what really happens is a lot of associations can't afford to do it every single year. So yeah, absolutely what they were telling you, to do it every other year or at least every third year at the, at the most. But every other year would be great and then just have to do a compilation in those interim years. The bad part about doing it every other year or every third year is when the CPA firm comes in, now we have to audit your beginning balances besides your ending balances because now we have to make sure that these are really correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, who or what decides that it's actually excess operational funds? Is there a percentage? No, when, when I showed you that income statement, so at the end of the year, you, you have your income statement, your operating fund has excess mm -hmm. net income. Even, at the end like, of the year. even if it's $1,000? Well, yeah, if it's $1,000, you can make the decision not to do anything. 
okay, unless your bylaws and DEC says to refund it. Mm -hmm. So you can just keep it there. You can transfer it to that operating contingency, or you can make um, an election, and you should put in your minutes that you have decided to transfer this excess to your reserves. But make sure it's documented. Just don't transfer it. You want to make sure it's documented. All right, thank you. Actually, everybody do something else, but to kind of point that out. So when you do your budget, and you're budgeting for your operating, because you're supposed to net out at zero, right? Right. When you're budgeting for operating, so you're budgeting for your taking care of everything, but maybe you want more in your reserves, but you're not ready to provide a special assessment or um, you know, raise the raise the monthly assessments right. tremendously. Uh -huh. So, if you, I mean, and there are times you also end up with a deficit, right, in your operating expense. So, how does if you're just throwing it in reserves, are you taking it out of reserves to replace the deficit then? Too? Well, yeah. See, that's why I say you don't necessarily always want to just transfer any access to reserves. Continuity that's why to put it in that operating contingency because that does happen because you could run into a year where you have some extraordinary, whether they're extraordinary repairs or the snow plan, whatever. If you have an operating contingency fund, you're not taking it from reserves. You're just transferring it right over. Yes. So if you have a line that says excess snow plow removal or things like that, you should still set up a contingency? Well, no, when you say you have excess, so you have a regular snow plowing line item and an excess snow plowing right. line. So you're kind of taking that into consideration, I'm assuming, when you have this excess snow plow. Is that to, to make sure that, hey, you have some extra funds in there just in case it's a bad winter? Or you heard the weather report for the year that says no, this will it's be... always a... there. Okay. So, yeah. So, if you're not going to use that, I mean, so basically now you're, you're over-budgeting, you know, and so are you going to always keep that excess? And what's happening is you're getting all this excess operating funds. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to decrease assessments then in the future if you build this all up? Can you decrease assessments? I would yes. never do that. <laughs> Never, right? Check your bylaws. You you yeah. <laughs> well, you can stay stable, but someone had said you can, even if you wanted to, you could not decrease assessments. Read your bylaws. But you have to read your bylaws with actually account yeah. where you have to give back the money. Yeah. And, and to an extent. Yeah. In our right. Correct. Yeah. Hmm. Going back to the lady back here, if you have an operating loss over the year, you cannot, my understanding is you cannot transfer from the reserve fund to the operating fund. That's absolutely correct. You do that. You're not supposed to. What? Let me put it that way. Uh, we've seen it done, but you're not supposed to. Tighten the belt. Right, because you told yeah. people these are for the reserve. What happens now if you don't have the money available for the reserve, reserve projects? Then you got to tell them, oh, we got a special assessment. We use that because yeah. we under budget. We used all that money in previous year. Well, and the other good thing about we we do do the certified account every year, mm -hmm. and one thing that's good, I think, it tells your members, here it is. You know, have have at it. If you nobody's ever asked to look, but things to do, here it is. You know, we're being as transparent as as possible. Right. So we should look at it. We email you what forms are we asking you for? Um, if you need investment policy or um, description, detail of comp review audit. You can just put that in. And my cards are up at the front if uh, you want it. Where is your phone number? I know it's, it, um, my cards are up here. I, it's it's uh, 282 uh, 34, uh, well, forget it. It's better than. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Cool. It's supposed to be 6340, that's why I said forget it. Because it's not the last number, it was the first number. Oh, all right. Well, we'll pick up and start. My, my uh, admin kind of had a mistake. <coughs> yes. I'm sorry, I was late, so I didn't get in on the first part of it. Uh, if it's a self managed group association, mm -hmm. and yeah, we have three board members. One board member have not seen an audit legend or any of the books, and they requested it. And the other two board members cited that 
Signatures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the management association really, really manages those funds for us. So they they have full control over your reserve funds, including the signatory to pay any expenditures out of the reserve funds. Well, to pay expenditures, yes, because that's all. I mean, that's that system is all set up. Yeah, no, I would never recommend that. I always recommend that the board should have total control over the reserve. Operating as well. No, the operating, they, they have to. They have to pay your monthly bills. Okay, so, but they don't have to have signature. Well. The management company that effectively does not have right, to have signature. Right, right, So do you recommend that as well or just let? No, uh, again. Uh, because the they have their right. They don't have to because only over a certain dollar. I mean, that's where you put in over a certain dollar amount. And you recommend that over a certain dollar amount? Well, if it's small things, I mean, you know, and you're looking over the financials every single month, it's when it gets to be a large expenditure that's already gone out of your account. Like roof replacement or something like that. Well, that's, so that's out of your reserve fund, so you should have total control. Oh, yeah, that is. That's you should be approving that and paying that yeah, and transferring those yeah. funds over. Yes. Okay, I'm going to, uh, do you want to take a little break here? Steve, thank you. You did a great job. My pleasure to introduce David Bloomberg, who's literally grown up in the business of being a lawyer. His father was one of the uh, originators of the Illinois Condo Act, but David has set his own, he's making his own history in the industry, doing a great job. He's uh, moving a firm called Chewhock in Texas. By the way, both Steve and David's cards are here at the, at the front if any of you need to take them, so please don't hesitate. But as I said before, David's making his own mark in the industry. We're delighted to have him here. Uh, he is a principal at the firm and concentrates his uh, business and product liability litigation, commercial litigation, and commercial. I mean, in condominium and condom interest community association law. He also does a lot of lecturing for CAI and many of the other trade groups. So I appreciate you taking the time out to be here tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, Tuesday night, and we're here to talk about condo law. I'll try to make it interesting, I'll try to make it snappy. Good luck. Um, and unfortunately, I'm here not to talk about a dire issue I thought we were called out to do. Uh, many of my recent topics are focused on dysfunctional boards, how to save dysfunctional situations, how to stop fraudulent board members, really depressing, upsetting things. This is a presentation focused on how to improve our lives, how to, how to match up the reality of today's world that we're living in. With the, uh, with the condo act and with the board management and everything else. Um, as a combination, I do a lot of litigation. Um, I'm in the courtroom quite a bit. Uh, cut my teeth in courtrooms doing trial work. And uh, preparing for today's presentation and other presentations I've given on electronic notice, it really occurred to me how utterly ridiculous the uh, rules are right now with respect to service of complaints and other papers in, the, in, in litigation. Um, everything I do in my office, uh, I download. I don't even really keep paper files anymore. Everything I get, every order I get, it's scanned in, it's available to me online, I can send it to somebody from my house, I can send it to somebody from the beach, um, I can access it at any place at any time. Um, and, you know, I find myself, uh, you know, communicating with somebody's attorney about a case, and I say, well, here's a copy of the complaint. Now, you haven't served it on, uh, on me yet. And I'm thinking, well, you have notice of it. And the purpose for which these laws were enacted years ago for somebody to obtain service of a document, notification of a lawsuit, 
notification of emotion is to make sure they got it. And now here I am hitting a button and they have it. But the law still says, no, they don't have it until these specific anachronistic things have happened. The sheriff places it in your hand or places it in, in these things. And now I have to give the judge a green hand in our forcible, green card in our forcible cases. And these kids coming out of law school, what's a green card? I've never seen that in my whole life. But fortunately, and belatedly in recent years, uh, the Illinois Condominium Act and other laws relating to the administration of condominium properties have come in line and we're starting to see things where uh, the realities of today's forms of communication, electronically and otherwise, um, are matching up with what the law will allow and require. And uh, I'm going to really focus today on uh, two of those forms, which is receiving electronic notice uh, for meetings and other kinds of things, and also the ability for unit owners to uh, electronically vote. These things are allowed for in the condo act, but as with everything in condominium law, the implementation and administration of these laws is never as easy as you'd like it to be and requires some uh, explanation. It will require some questions on your specific situations to me, as always happens, and I'm happy to do that. Um, let's start with the uh, laws in the Illinois Condominium Act that relate to this. And this is in the back of my presentation, I've included that. Uh, and if anybody, incidentally, I didn't bring them with me, would like a copy of the Illinois Condominium Act, you know, my firm often hands those out and provide them. We have great annotated books of both the Illinois Condominium Property Act and the Common Interest Community Act. So you can take my car, email me, I might be to provide those to you free of charge. Um, let's start with 18.8, new 18.8 of the Illinois Condominium Property Act. Any notice, any notice required to be sent to receive uh, vote, consent, or approval required to be obtained under any condominium instrument or any provision of the Act may be accomplished using the technology generally available at the time. Um, associations, unit orders, and other persons entitled to occupy a unit may perform any obligation or exercise any right under any condominium, inst any condominium instrument or any provision of this Act by use of any technological means. The electronic signature satisfies any provision, any requirement for a signature under any condominium, condominium instrument or any provision of this act. Voting on consent to and approval of any matter under any condominium instrument or any provision of the act may be accomplished by electronic transmission or other equivalent technological means, provided that a record is created as evidence thereof and maintained as long as the record would be required to be maintained in non-electronic form. Now reading this, one would think, we're good. We can just start, we're going to send emails for everything. If somebody wants to vote for something, they'll just send me an email and all that. But I do not recommend that people start willy-nilly uh, using these electronic means. In my opinion, and from what I've seen, the correct way to handle this is for every board in every association to sit down based on their specific ways of doing business and figure out how they're going to deal with these new laws. Um, representing associations throughout the Chicago area, you learn pretty, pretty quickly, and Tom and any other property manager will attest that every condominium board has its own culture, its own way of doing things historically its own personalities, and uh, the own, its own way that it deals with other unit owners. And I think that every association must bring that culture and the way of doing things to bear when they consider these things. Um, before we talk about the how, let's talk about the difference. Let's highlight and reiterate the difference between the governing documents that every association has. You always have your declaration and bylaws. And uh, in all cases, I will assume for purposes of this discussion that none of your associations currently have declarations that were passed originally with anything providing for electronic voting. Um, I'll further assume that um, you know declarations that you have provide for a pretty high number of unit owner approval to amend your bylaws or declarations. For that reason, and as contemplated by the laws, 
we always recommend that if you want to enact anything regarding um, electronic voting, that you do so under Section 18.4 of the Act, which allows for the adoption of rules and regulations. Every association has rules and regulations, and unlike declarations and bylaws, they can be added to, amended by board vote alone. Um, you know, a lot of rules and regulations that you have, you know, relate to this is the binding schedule. These are the rules about how we use our pools. These are the rules about how we're going to deal with putting out the trash. And necessarily these rules uh, kind of deal with the day-to-day -day situations of how we're going to want uh, and enforce the uh, interaction and, and the daily living conditions of our association. Um, and it's pretty easy to get rules and uh, regulations enacted. Um, 18.4H of the Act allows for uh, implementation of rules as long as the people and the union owners in the association get notice. Um, a meeting of the union owners must be called if you want to adopt a rule for the specific purpose of discussing the proposed rules and regulations. Notice of the meeting in which you're going to adopt the rules shall contain the full text of the proposed rules and regulations, and the meeting must conform to other unit order meetings in the Act, except you don't need a quorum, um, and uh, you, know, you can't pass rules that otherwise inhibit somebody's rights under the Constitution, you can't inhibit free speech or anything like that. But this is the perfect vehicle to enact rules governing electronic uh, voting and, and uh, like a notice to be given for uh, union order meetings and board meetings. Can I, can I ask a question on that? Of course. So, so um, say you want to limit the number of rentals in your condominium complex. Yes. Right. Uh, we just went through this. That's why I'm asking it. And we could, because we got people scattered all over the country, we were not able to get all of the boats in on time before the election expired and you know, basically it didn't work. Um, could we, uh, am I understanding you correctly that we could have used 18.4 to actually make that a board vote provided we sent out that um, uh, notification with the exact wording of the uh, statement of the change of the rules? Right? The answer on a basic level is yes, but I would not recommend you ever passing a rule <coughs> about rentals. Um, given especially a, a case that was um, came down last year in the city of Chicago on this stuff. Let me back up. Declarations, recorded documents, bylaws, those are given uh, total deference by courts of law. Um, they are usually done if they're going to be amendment with, with a super majority of unit owners. They're going to have uh, the they're going to really govern people. You know, when people buy in, that's the rules that govern everything. Rules and regulations, uh, in contrast, are given much less deference by courts. They're subject to a rule of reasonableness. Mm -hmm. The case I'm talking about with respect specifically to the limitation of rentals and associations uh, held that you can't pass a rule about it. If you already have in your declaration anything that permits rentals or discusses rentals, then anything you want to do limiting rentals or altering the buildings uh, rules or, or conditions about rentals, uh, it has to be done in the declaration itself. So if you're going to pass something uh, that's going to change that, uh, it's, it's subject to be avoided by the courts. So depending on your specific situation and what your declaration says, I would, most, in most cases, not recommend that you uh, enact rules and regulations as it relates to the rental restrictions. But electronic voting, on the other hand, you know, that's something that is especially right for a rule and regulation. And um, the other reason you want to do that is it really sets forth specifically how it's going to be done. It provides for the predictability necessary that will allow, this is how notices are going to be sent out. Uh, it kind of provides an easy roadmap for how the management companies can handle noticing, um, how um, everyone's going to provide information about their email addresses. And that leads me to the next important point. To the extent anybody wants to receive electronic notices of meetings, it is, needs to be an affirmative opt-in. You can't assume that anybody is just going to accept electronic notice. 
Unless somebody says, I want electronic notice, then the association is obligated to continue to send notice to them by the mail as called for in the declaration and under the act. Um, I believe all the management companies at this point, especially when it's sophisticated as ACM, has a simple opt-in provision that they use to send to people just to indicate, you know, I would like to opt in and receive electronic communication, you know, providing details about what that means, uh, providing the information, this is going to be the email address that will be sufficient, um, and the opt-in provision will provide that kind of notice. More importantly, uh, that notice, as well as any rule you pass, should put the onus upon the unit owner itself, if they want to make a change, to let the association know. Uh, if they want to make a change, you can't assume the association is going to know that you've changed email addresses or you're going to have a, you want to have a different way to get notice. Mm -hmm. Once you sign that opt-in provision, it should clearly be that any change that, that, that wants to be made by the unit owner should be affirmatively set, stated. Um, so to be clear, nobody can receive electronic notice unless they specifically opt in to do so. Um, another reason that you really want to have specific rules about electronic notice is uh, to eliminate problems. Uh, as the law is currently stated, it doesn't really provide what kind of electronic notice would be sufficient. So you're opening a door to say that, um, well, email is one way, but also, you know, board members can say, well, you know, that I, I want to receive a, a text message. I want to receive my net messages only by fax machine. And that opens just a door for all sorts of problems and difficulties. It should be one predictable method that the board will allow for electronic notice. It should be email, I would think. Everybody uses email. And uh, there should be some kind of a method for verification that the emails went out, which leads to the next important point when it comes to electronic notice, which is record keeping. Um, anytime you enact a rule like this, I think it's very important for a board to sit down with their management company. Um, big management companies like ACM already have kind of this down, but uh, you should touch base with the, with the manager about how they're going to keep records of electronic notice that go out how they're going to keep records of the various emails that are called for to be received by the opt-in notices, um, and what means by which they're going to be, they have, through their systems, that these notices were effectively sent out, and, and how those records are going to be kept. Um, because a lot of management companies, it's new to them too. So it's just a quick conversation to make sure that once we enact this, this is how it's going to be, this is how we're going to keep our records. Um, as I said before, declaration amendments to add electronic notice uh, are usually unnecessary as long as you don't have a declaration as we're assuming today that doesn't prohibit electronic notice. Um, and again, I do think it should be a, a real board discussion about what's going to work for that specific association based on the culture and how it's <coughs> Um, let's go and move on to electronic voting. Quick question. Quick. On the yeah, opt-in, sure. how long do you have to keep that document on the opt-in? I would think, think you'd have to keep it as long as the, so, as long as the uh, unit owner lives there. Um, I think you'd want to have it as part of your files to, to you know, let's, let's say the guy becomes delinquent in his assessments or, or claims that he did receive notice of a meeting. Uh, I think it's important to kind of trace it back to the fact that you, uh, I sent you this email, number one, about the meeting, and number two, you provided me this email address to use, and here's the email address I sent it to. Um, I don't think it's too big of a burden to keep records like that. Um, it's like anything else. When somebody moves in to a building, you have their information, you have their address if they're an off-site unit owner, you have their lease if they're renting the unit, about all, all that information, you kept in a file like that. Any other questions? Yes. Um, we're a small 80-unit SICA temple yes. association. We would like to go for electronic notice, but we're, we figure we think we're too small to make the investment for voting. Sure. We can separate them. Absolutely. Okay. That's why I'm trying to separate the top. Voting is separate. Um, when when you change, or if you change management company. Is the old one in some way obligated to provide that 
documentation of the email notices, etc., to the new one? Yeah. The answer is absolutely yes. You have to understand the role of a management agent. And, you know, it's a wonderful resource to have, and, and associations of a certain size really benefit from the resources of a management company. But make no mistake, the basic relationship is a contractual one in which the managing agent is the agent of the board. So the records that are kept by the managing agent are the board's records. They don't belong to the managing agent, they belong to the board. So anytime you make any kind of a change, um, those files must be transferred because they are not the record of that managing agent, they are the record of the board. And uh, records such as electronic notice and voting would go along with that. It's just like attorneys, you know, uh, when files get transferred, um, you know, transfer the files I have with the association are my files, but they belong to the association, just like the privilege belongs to the association with the attorney client. And um, that, that, that's how those records will be kept. Um, but, but it raises another question, is what happens if the records are kept electronically? And uh, like anything else, you should have an understanding about how and, how and where your records are kept. <clears throat> so you get a, say you get a request under the Condo Act or under SICA that I want to inspect some of the records. Um, if those records aren't provided in a timely fashion and it draws a lawsuit to compel the production of them, uh, that lawsuit's not going to the management company, it's coming against the board. And it's the liability of the board to produce them. <coughs> and um, we face lawsuits where you, know, you haven't turned over the records in a timely fashion, or you haven't kept the records, and that becomes a breach of fiduciary duty, which you're obligated to keep, keep good records. And in a lawsuit in which you're sued for those kinds of things, uh, you, the attorney suing or the unit owner suing can get the fees incurred in uh, getting the getting a court to compel the production of those records. Electronic voting. Um, in recent years, uh, I think everyone can attest that there's been a major increase in disputes relative to elections. Um, as Steve can attest, he's called upon to administer yearly voting elections, whether it be a special assessment vote, or more commonly, the uh, annual meeting vote for the new board members. Um, the essential need to have predictable, uh, fair, and accurate elections has become heightened in recent years. Um, elections really mean the transfer of power and who's going to run the association. Um, and uh, in certain associations, these, these elections become very contentious. Um, I've been in court countless times over the past six years over fights involving elections and more specifically proxies. Mm -hmm. Let me explain what a proxy is for those who don't know. It's not an absentee ballot, it's not like that. A proxy is me saying, uh, you, I'm giving you, as a unit owner, this piece of paper to entitle you to vote on my behalf. And it gives the proxy holder the, vote, the ability to vote for your unit. Um, proxies can take all sorts of different forms. There are basic requirements under the Act about what proxies must contain. But on a very basic level, it allows somebody else to vote on your behalf. Um, I think in response to a proliferation of lawsuits on this issue, and in response to the difficulty in enforcing uh, fights that involve proxies, because all you need is a signature, and you know, there's been a lot of questions about whether there's been fraudulent proxies made. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard thing to prove. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a lot of people. You know, a lot of people would go around associations saying, "Here, sign this piece of paper." You know, it's for the election, and then people would sign it, and they don't know what they're signing. And the next thing you know, it, 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 you know, these are the things that lead to court actions. So, in light of what I'm saying about the electronic age, uh, the law is starting to recognize that instead of giving proxies, a lot of associations just want votes to be done and tallied electronically. Um, that could take a whole host of meetings, as I'll discuss, but what that means is that your vote on a ballot will be submitted in advance of the election through electronic means, and that will be the vote. And uh, the Condo Act has allowed very, has enacted a very specific rule about uh, enacting uh, board rules that will eliminate proxies and allow for electronic voting. 
Let's see, let's look at 18B9, it's on page 7 of my handout. If a rule is adopted at least 120 days before a board, ele before a board election, or the declaration to bylaws provide for balloting is set forth here, union owners may not vote by proxy in board elections, but may vote only either by submitting an association issued ballot in person at an election meeting, or by submitting an association issued ballot to the association or its designated agent by mail or means of delivery specified in the declaration. B5 has the same thing, but instead of issuing the ballot by mail, it allows you to submit the ballot by any acceptable technological means, uh, including instructions regarding the use of electronic means, must be distributed to all union owners not less than 10 and not more than 30 days before the election meeting, and the board shall give union owners not less than 21 days prior written notice of the deadline for inclusion of a candidate's name on the ballots. The deadline shall be no more than seven days before the instructions for voting using electronic or acceptable technological means is distributed to the unit owners. So this is a remarkable, remarkable statute. It really sets forth a detailed way to transition from doing things one way to doing things a different way. This calls for at least six months, it's about six months before an election. Uh, you pass a rule, and, and you know, but at this point, my law firm and, and ACM have seen all sorts of draft rules that will allow for the elimination of proxies and a new, a new process uh, for balloting. Um, the question is, how do, you, how do you set this up? And you know, what comes in here is, is um, how do you implement it? It can be very confusing. Um, for condominiums, uh, you really have to look at the timing requirements for changing the voting rules. Uh, and you look at these other deadlines. Managers here have to be very careful to make sure that boards are soliciting candidate names at least 21 days in advance of the deadline. This doesn't mean you can't get nominations from the floor. But with respect to the ballots that go out prior to the election, you need to have candidate names seven days before ballots are distributed. So you really have to go with the timeline. This is, you have to work backwards. This is when the annual meeting is going to be. And this is when, again, when we're going to send out the notice. And this is when we're going to finalize the ballots. And seven days before that, we have to cut off nominations. So you really have to plan ahead. Uh, annual meetings take on kind of a more formal process mm -hmm. with a set calendar in advance of how exactly we're going to do things. Uh, many associations, uh, consequently, are turning to vendors to handle uh, voting. Um, fortunately, uh, companies like ACM, I think, have the technological means, and Tom can discuss this further, to implement a system that takes the responsibility off the boards. But again, I recommend whoever you're going to use to implement electronic voting, you sit down and you go through exactly how it's going to work. <coughs> Um, I found that the first time through this process, it takes a lot of handholding. It takes a lot of communication with your unit owners about how this change is going to be implemented. If I've learned one thing in my practice, it's that many boards in acting and communicating with unit owners carry the presumption of not untrustworthiness. Wait, you're making a change, it involves elections. Does this mean you're just doing this to try to make things easier or to rig the election for yourself? So the way to handle this, as with most board business, is to do this with a lot of transparency, with a lot of explanation, a lot of ability for unit owners to get their questions answered, and with enough notice that when it happens, people are prepared. And that the method by which you're going to do the electronic voting is clearly communicated and clearly uh, set forth with the unit owners. So when it takes place, everybody has an understanding. What this doesn't take away is still the basics. You're still going to have an annual meeting at a set place and time. You're still going to have the ability for anybody to show up at that meeting to cast votes for candidates. Um, you still have the rule that if somebody shows up with a written ballot, uh, that can overrule their electronic ballot. So you have to have a system that's nimble enough to allow for that. Uh, you still have to allow for nominations from the floor. 
even though you're cutting off people uh, from you know, submitting their name on a ballot, uh, it does not eliminate the ability and the right of every unit owner in association to run for a board position and nominate themselves from the floor. I mean, you might argue, well, that gives them less of a chance, but it, means, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't still have that chance to begin with. Um, everybody still has the right to submit a nomination of themselves from the floor. Obviously, you can't go back in time. If they, if they nominate themselves, I mean, and people have already voted, you know, they, they've already lost all those votes, but you still have to have that ability. And to be frank, a lot of, a lot of associations, especially in the suburbs, um, I'm talking about a situation where you know, so many of them had a hard time getting a quorum to begin with. I mean, I might be speaking to So, you know, in that case, it's not going to eliminate things. But, but that also begs the question, maybe this, enacting electronic voting, letting people do it without having to show up to a meeting, uh, maybe that's the secret to getting more participation. Because votes electronically counts towards a quorum. And maybe that's a way to really get people involved in something to think about. Got a couple questions. I know you were raising your hand first. I did. A nomination from the floor, is that in the bylaws that you can't do it or you can regardless? It's, it's usually just, it's, it's in the condo act. It's really based on anybody has the right to run for a board position. And there's no method set forth uh, by which um, you have to submit your nominations. You're unable to run for a board position. It's kind of a, a right of law that any every unit owner has to be treated equally, and everyone has to have an equal right to run for a board position. So we have one position available at our last board, but we were told, or I was told, I mean. We were told you could not, any, someone on the floor, you know, homeowners there, could not say, I would, I would like to run. It would just then be the board members <coughs> interviewing that person. Yeah, I'd have to talk to you more specifically about your situation. But uh, it's generally a right that, you know, anybody has a right. I mean, it's, it's like a writing candidate. Anybody has the right to at least submit themselves as a candidate for the board to be considered. Right. They're not going to get the consideration in the packet that goes out with their qualifications right. and their resume. But if somebody wants to at least put their name out there, uh, opportunity-wise or not, uh, they have that right. And I would not want to go up in court against somebody that was denied that right. <laughs> I just want to know. No, no, I'm happy to talk about for about your situation in the background, but yeah, that would, I, I've seen it. Yeah. Are you are you dealing with anybody who has implemented this yet? Yes. And what's what's their response to, to votes? I mean, like percentage response. Uh, I think in, in, in the associations that have done it, uh, we saw we saw either the same level of participation or a little increase. Right. Um, but but again, the reason I, I I made such a strong point about communicating and transparency about how you're going to implement this is that uh, doing it. Uh, without really making a campaign by the board to really make an effort to let people know about this change will lead to, will, might lead to some resentment and some confusion. Uh, and what we found is that really planning, you know, writing uh, letters to unit owners about how this change is going to work, giving them the advance notice, you know, the 120 days that's allowed by the statute to let people know that this change is going to be made is really <coughs> to give people enough notice that um, you're eliminating proxies and to call a meeting about this rule change being made uh, really gives people the chance to at least be aware of that. It's really up to the board to highlight it and to, and, and to walk them through it in my experience. It really is helpful. Yeah? How do you deal with uh, homeowners who don't like giving up their email address? <clears throat> right. How? I mean, That's you have to. Oh, don't, well, they have a choice. They don't have to give it up. No, you don't have right. to. Send them a mail. Send them the mail. I mean, you could be as big of a lot as you want. You don't have to. You don't have to receive <laughs> any emails if you don't want. I mean, it just makes it a little bit more of an administrative burden. But somebody like you know, you know man, most management companies can deal with it, and they do deal with it. Uh, but that's the answer. Yeah. Sure. Uh, in the back, yeah. yeah. Are there any restrictions? Um, on homeowner information that you should provide to other homeowners. So, for instance, with the directories, we've got everybody's emails at this point in our HOA, and we're doing a lot of things electronically. Um, and so, one of the questions we got was, well, gee whiz, instead of just providing homeowner's name, 
and address and, and phone, can you provide their emails as well? Uh, you know, look, there's nothing prohibiting you from, from, from distributing emails and uh, everybody under the Condo Act has a right to a list of unit owners and their addresses under Section 19 of the Condo Act. But the way around, you know, concerns about privacy and the unauthorized use of those emails, which might be what you're asking about, uh, is to pass policies and regulations relating to solicitations and appropriate forms of inner unit communication, um, you know, uh, door drops and things of that nature. You're allowed to regulate those things to a degree. Uh, it's going to relate to, you know, this person wants to send out uh, a flyer or to advertise for their business. That kind of stuff should be addressed. That you know, if you if you ever get a unit order contact information, uh, it's to be used for the appropriate purposes. Right, and that's actually that's how we were able to get everybody. Is we assured it would just be. Yeah, and I, I would have something on the opt-in. I, I would put something on the opt-in about how it's going to be used. Yeah, and I think a lot of forms already have that. But there's no restriction in Illinois. Well, it would have to be the written opt-in. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that when you when you talk to your owners who don't want to give out their emails, suggesting that they set up a separate like Gmail or something that's readily available free to them and doesn't impact their personal email, that they can set up a separate one. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, regarding electronic voting, if an owner owns multiple units, do they have to submit a separate email? I mean, like, say, for board members? Or can they put down, say, I own 25 units and I want my 25 votes to go here? I've seen it done both ways. Um, okay. I mean, you, I've seen ballots where I'm voting for this many units, and most auditors have the ability to deal with that, and uh, I see I see no reason to have to do that, that way, but I've also seen associations for whatever limitations are there saying you, know, you have to submit one ballot per well, unit. Yeah, because for the depending But emails, I don't think you need to. The unit depends upon how much equity they have for the vote. Well, let's say you own five units. I mean, you can put your email down five times. I mean, you're still going to get one email on it, you know, so I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's necessary. Anyone else? Yeah. What about having owners attend by phone? Maybe oh, yeah. Absentee? I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, I think you answered this question. In a, is, is the electronic vote counts towards the proxy, I mean towards the quorum yes. of the meeting? Yes, it does. Okay, but if another issue came up that required a quorum vote, that hadn't been on the notice or anything else. Uh, can you vote on it with whoever is available, or, or is it not a quorum if something else comes up? Well, uh, the answer to that is anything you're going to vote on should be set forth in the notice electronically and, and make that available. Um, if there's other business to be conducted that's not going to be subject to that electronic voting, um, then yeah, I mean you're only looking at a quorum of who's there. But I wouldn't recommend taking votes on things that aren't previously noticed to you. Okay. What, what a situation, we had the full board, we had two of the seven, or three of the seven members were coming up for vote, notice was sent out all, and between when the notice was sent out and we had the meeting, one of the board members got a promotion or something and announced he was resigning and moving. And we got a, you know, a nomination from the floor. And we could have voted then with the, the six or eight people that were at the meeting. If we had had electronic voting, they counted towards our proxies. Well, what you're saying is the following situation. You sent out the notice to everybody that there was going to be two open board spots. Subsequent to sending out the initial notice, a third board spot opened up. Um, I mean, what that would, be, what that would do, in my opinion, would be to create a separate vacancy that could be filled by the board separately, not by the union or the vote. Okay. Be a separate situation. All right. Before I run out of time, I did want to cover uh, <coughs> attending uh, union owner meetings electronically. Yes. 
which allows us to have our dreams, to, to, to participate in the board meeting, sitting on my couch, don't have to get dressed up, <laughs> making all sorts of gestures at the phone about what I'm thinking about what's happening. <laughs> you all do it. I know you do it. 18A9B. Board members may participate in and act at any meeting of the board manager in person, by telephone means, or by use of any tech any acceptable technological means whereby all persons participating in the meeting can communicate with each other. That participation constitutes attendance and presence in person at the meeting. Um, what that means is that uh, you can have board members attending meetings or the perfect board meetings in an absentee fashion as long as that uh, ability to participate is made available to everybody. That's typically done by call-in number, um, and you know they don't necessarily need to be able to speak, but they, they, they have to be able to participate you know, uh, in the meeting. So you can't just have one person <coughs> to call in and not anybody else. Right. But I recommend sending out a call-in number for anybody that wants to participate in the meeting. You know, or some years. No. <laughs> but also, shouldn't the board members know that this person never shows up? And lo and behold, the president told them that they could call in or we would fill you in on what's going on. You talking about a board member? Yeah, uh-huh. Getting the board meeting. Instead of coming in person, they never show up. The meeting. president gave them permission, but none of the other board members know that they are. Hey, if you're calling a board meeting, you should probably know who's going to be there and who's not. Um, and you should probably work, work amongst yourself on the board who's going to be calling and who's going to be there in person. And the other board members should know. Yeah, you know that, that would be best practices. But I mean, you know, look, you know, we have absentees, you know, board members, we have board members living in different states sometimes, people travel, people have things. And, you know, if you can have an effective board meeting where somebody can participate by phone or by video conferencing or otherwise, then that would be an acceptable way to do it. It's my opinion that there's still no substitute board meetings for some for everybody being there in person and having face-to-face -face conversations. But I think this provision uh, accommodates the fact that you know, sometimes board meetings need to take place on short notice. Sometimes there's emergencies. Sometimes it's not feasible for all the board members to be there, and this provides for, uh, I think, an enhanced ability for everybody to participate if necessary and uh, to listen in, you know, it, it encourages more transparency in the opinion. Okay. Yes? We had a board meeting, a board member, we have five board members, one, one of which um, called in, or couldn't come at the last minute, and he participated by phone, which was fine. But then he said, I can't be there for the whole meeting. I can come on during closed session. Mm -hmm. We can talk about closed stuff, but I've got you know, young kids. I've got to get them ready for bed, blah, blah, blah. So I can't yeah. attend by phone the whole meeting. Mm -hmm. We didn't even call him. He was just, we just marked him as absent. Okay. You, can't, you can't have a board member picking and choosing what pieces of the board meeting they want to call in on. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that for sure. I'd say you shouldn't pick and choose. You know, if you're going to be a board member, you should be there. But um, I wouldn't have excluded. Uh, luckily, it didn't matter because we had a quorum. Yeah, right. But I mean, if you have a board member that wants to participate, you know, you know, it's, it would be more of an tangible thing than a tangible thing. Obviously, the business was conducted. He wasn't challenging, but if he if he, did, if he expressed the desire to participate in some part or all of the meeting and then made himself available. I would just say as a matter of best practice, I would have included it. Oh, okay. So you're totally out of it. You're either there for the whole thing or not. I don't necessarily agree with that. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I wanted to end early. It looks like I'm there. I'll take any more questions, though. All right. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.